Wow, this is amazing. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, I know that we're going to have an amazing time this weekend as we're together, as we hear more messages, as we pray together, as we seek the Lord. I know that, the God, that God is going to pour out his spirit on this place. And not because we're worthy, but because he is good. And his spirit is the thing that we need the most. We need that more than anything else. More than funding for the mission field, we need his spirit. More than missionaries for the mission field, we need his spirit. Because his spirit, all blessings follow in the train of his spirit. In receiving him, everything is, is, it comes. There was a story of a man who, um, a young couple came to him and said, will you pray for me? We have, we, we have terrible short tempers. We are irritable and we just fly off the handle and we just need more patience. Can you please pray that we can have more patience? And he said, no, I'm not gonna pray that you can have more patience. And they got upset with him. <laughs> they got impatient with him and says, why, have we gone too far? Are we too far? Are we you know, hopeless? He says, no, not at all. He says, I will pray that you will have more of Christ. And when you receive him, then his patience will flow. And isn't that what we want? More of Christ. Because Christ is patient. If he, he doesn't like take a little bit of his personality and give it to you, he gives himself to us. And that's exciting. That's amazing. Today I want to begin with a little parable that Jesus spoke of in uh, Matthew 22 and in, and in Luke 14. Matthew 24, 22, you remember it's the parable of the marriage feast. And you know this very well. Um, a wealthy king had a son who was having a wedding and so he was gonna have a party. And so he sent out invitations to all the worthies to come to the wedding feast. It's gonna be an amazing affair. Um, spared no expense. And you remember what happened. Those worthies were too busy. <laughs> One of them had just purchased some new land. Another one had some new, a new car, tractor, you know, oxen, and they were too busy. And so the king said of those people, they were unworthy, which I believe gives us a sense of what can make us worthy of the kingdom of God. That would be to value it to want it, to want the kingdom of God enough to put the other things to the side and go, go after it, to accept that invitation and go in. Um, and I was thinking about that the other day, well, a couple years ago. It's like, what do get, what, these people were being invited to the marriage feast, but they weren't being invited as the groom. They weren't being invited as the bride. They were being invited as guests to see a bride and a groom get married. And so I was thinking about that, because um, I've always heard or understood that the marriage feast, this marriage feast was the, of the, you know, it's like accepting the kingdom of God into your life and being, you know, maybe the marriage feast was the second coming and so being ready for the second coming. And so I started thinking about that, but, you know, it's not a picture of the, invitees getting married. They're there to watch or to be a part of that marriage, to be witnesses to that marriage. So who are these guests and what really is that marriage supper? What is that marriage feast? And I started thinking, okay, what do guests do? What do guests do when they come to the wedding? They don't marry anybody. They come and they watch somebody get married, okay? And I started thinking through the Gospels. In the four Gospels, what is the place that specifically talks about watching a marriage and having joy. Besides the Canaan one, I mean, they didn't, Jesus didn't talk about having joy watching that marriage. He did a miracle there, so he blessed that marriage, but the only place that I found was in John the Baptist when he says, I am not the Messiah, I am the friend of the groom, and I rejoice to hear his voice. 
So John the Baptist's job was to introduce Jesus to the people, or the people to Jesus, the bride to the groom. And when he saw the bride accept the groom, it brought him great joy. That was his life mission. If he could fulfill that mission, he could die in peace, okay? So that, that was his, his focus. Now, the other thing that the guests do at a wedding is they eat. <laughs> All right, um, that's one of the main reasons I go. But anyway, um, so they eat. And so if you look at the Gospels, where in the Gospels do we see somebody eating and being filled and being full and talking about it? Isn't it the, when Jesus talked to the, the, the woman at the well, where he says, I have food that you know not of, okay, for my food is to do that. What, did, what just happened? Jesus had introduced eternal life to the woman and then the whole entire town, okay? That gave him joy, that gave him, uh, that just built him up, that just really fed his, his soul, fed his spirit. And so we see these two things, they eat and they watch, that gives them joy, gives them life, feeds their spirit, feeds their soul. And so I would like to submit to you the idea that the marriage feast is actually the gospel commission. Okay? So as we share Jesus with others, we find joy. And it feeds our spirit. It feeds our soul. It feeds our spiritual life. And we grow through it. And so the invitation went out to the worthies, those that were worthy of the invitation. They, you know, were worthy enough to own a field, buy a field, to buy cattle, to get married, and all that kind of stuff. The invitation went out, please come and join the Gospel Commission. And they said, I'm too busy. I got other stuff in my life. And so, the gospel, and so that invitation then went to the poor, the lame, the blind, anybody that would come. And I believe that this is the Gospel Commission. Now this also gives us a different picture because we often think about the work that needs to be done out there, taking the gospel to the world. We think of it as we have to do this work in order for Jesus to come. I think that's the wrong picture because a lot of people say, you know, they have the attitude of like, well, what's it going to take to get this done? Because, <laughs> you know, I'm kinda, I, I, I want to go home. I'm tired of the pain in this world. I just want to go home. And that's really kind of selfish if you think about it. I'm tired of the pain, so I want the gospel to get over there so that we can, I can get out of this misery that I'm in, okay? And I think a lot of times, if we could push a button and just go home right now, we would do it. Completely forgetting the billions out there that still haven't heard the gospel. And that's really sad thinking, and we're thinking, that heaven is a place, okay? We think that heaven is a place, or we think that heaven is freedom from distress. And we spend a majority of our lives trying to stay out of stress, or, or stay out of trouble, or stay out of misery, stay out of difficulty, stay out of pain, avoid pain, seek pleasure. But today, first, before we go on with this analogy, I want to give a little bit of update on what's happening in the world. What is the sign, what is the main sign of Jesus' second coming? A lot of people, yes, a lot of people, will, you know, I hear like in, in, in different meetings, they'll say, well, did you hear what happened today? A big flood down in so-and-so or a big earthquake? Jesus is coming soon. But Matthew 24 says there will be wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and earthquakes and all these things, but the end is not yet. <laughs> For this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world and then the end will come. Well, let's see how far, what is the, so that's the sign of Jesus coming. 
Let's take a brief look. This is um, a map that you can look at uh, or you can source for yourself on the joshuaproject.net website. And the green is what we call reached uh, countries. This is done by people group. So a reached people group, now first of all, a people group is a group of people that are separated from other people groups either by language or by ethnicity or by political or by geographical or caste. You know, it's a, it's a group of people where if they have the gospel, it will not easily transmit into the next gospel. So like you can have a people group on one mountain in western New Guinea and another people group right across the valley on another mountain complete, uh, speaking a completely different dialect. And it's very difficult for the gospel to go from here to there because they used to eat them. You know, so there's a lot of barriers. Sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. 825 languages in that area. Um, okay, so the red, the green part is what we consider reached people. That doesn't mean that the gospel work is completed. That doesn't mean that everybody in the reached people group is is a believer, okay? It just means that they have access to it. Like for instance, here in America, not everybody is a believer, amen? Is that true? Yeah, a lot of, st still a lot of work to be done, work that needs to be done, especially in our cities. But is, do, do the majority of people in this country have access to the gospel? Yes, yes, do the majority of people have a friend that may be a Christian? Yes. Can they turn on the TV and find a Christian guy giving the gospel? Yes. How many channels? Hundreds. <laughs> How many do they have? Do we have the Bible in English? Yes. How many versions? So an unreached people group would be a group of people where somebody could be born, live their entire life, and die without knowing a Christian, ever meeting a Christian, without ever hearing the name of Jesus, much less hearing the story of Jesus and understanding what that means for them. Born, raised, and die in a people group where, and some of those people groups have no missionary, no Christian, no Bible, nothing. Those are called unengaged unengaged people groups. That's somebody, that's a people group where nobody's even trying to reach them. There's about 1,600 of them out there. 1,600 people groups with no access to the gospel. Okay. And you can see most of them are, are right over there in the, um, what's what they call the 1040 window. And 1040 window is basically 10 degrees north of the equator to 40 degrees north of the equator, and it's that picture where you see all that red. That's where the unreached people groups are, right over there. Okay, let's look at the density, population density of the world, okay? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going over some of these basics because this really is, should be like the ABCs. Uh, we should understand this as a church because what, as a church, what is the main purpose of us organizing into church, into an organizational structure? So we can be more effective at taking the gospel to the world. That's the reason we organized in the beginning. Okay, so what's our primary job? Taking the gospel to the world. So shouldn't we know a little bit about our job? I mean, if you're gonna get hired to be an uh, administrative assistant in a big company, they would say, do you know Microsoft Word? And you'd say, no, but I hear it's a good pay. <laughs> you think you'd get hired. You think you'd be good at the job if you did get hired, unless you use like Mac and then you could use Pages or something, but not very many big companies do that. So it's important to know a little bit about what our job really is, okay? And it, it's actually quite amazing to me, shocking, that we don't have more education into unreached people groups, into the Great Commission, into different methods of cross-cultural evangelism. What does that even mean? 
or the names of some of these people groups. Um, most places I go, I say, does anybody know the name of an un I'm not going to ask you guys here because I know some of you do. No. But does anybody know the name of an unreached people group? Nobody knows a single name. There's like 6,000 of them out there. You just pick one. We haven't done even the basic research to find out who they are. And I'm not sure Jesus is really happy about that. And... Um, Okay, so this, the, the red part is where the people are. So that's like the denser parts. Where it gets red, that gets denser population. So you can see that majority of the population is over in this area here and here. Those two places. Okay. Um, in fact, more people live inside that circle than outside that circle. More people live inside there than the rest of the world combined. North America, we have 8% of the world's population, eight. South America, 8%. Africa, 15%. Europe, 12%. Asia, 57%. Wow. At the same time, Giving to all Christian ministry around the world, 92 to 96% is given to minister to the 8% that speak English. Okay. So, um, if we had 10 people up here and we had 10 bottles of water, we would give nine to the one on the end, and that one would have to be shared between the other nine. Now, if you had nine kids, or if I had nine kids, and I treated my kids like that, you think I would be a good father? No, I'd be a little partial. In fact, he'd probably turn me in. And so, what we're saying, and what we're promoting, and I believe what Jesus is saying, is that there's work to do here in America, but there's also work to do overseas especially the unreached people groups. Now, does that mean we stop work and go over there and, and do it all? I don't think that would be a bad idea, honestly, because if we emptied our churches here and went over and started churches over there, I can guarantee that the churches here would probably be filled again. Because if people around in the neighborhood saw, wow, that church believes so much in what they believe that they're sacrificing their nice houses and their nice cars and their comfortable to go over there and take the God, wow, they must, they must be onto something. They'd probably come figure out. Of course, the pastor would still be there so they could ask him. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is the opportunity that we have, I think. Um, let me keep going here. All right. Here is broken down by people group in that, set, in that part of the world. A people group is an individual dot. There's green dots, a few yellow dots, and there's red dots. And the red dot is a people group. Okay. So we've got a little opportunities. We've got a little bit of work to do. Let's look a little bit closer into... Now that one there is all Christians, okay, all Christian denominations, Catholic, Protestant, everything. That's counting that. This one, this map, is a study into uh, languages, by languages, of just the Southern Asia Pacific Division. This was put together by Clyde Morgan, paid for by the Southern Asia Division, to study their own division to find out who is unreached, where is our work uh, need to, to focus on. And so they, he went through and he figured out all the different languages and then did some research to find out if we have any SDA work in those languages, okay? Now in that division, I believe there's about 1,600 languages. And the green is where the, gospel, the Adventist church has good, strong work and the church is thriving. The yellow is the place where it's, you know, it's going, but it's kind of nominal. It's going real slow. 
And then, of course, the dark red is where there is no known Adventist work at all. So we have over 1,200 languages in just that one place, just that one division. Now, <clears throat> how do we handle this? Remember I said that the marriage feast is like a, a feast. It's an invitation to the Gospel Commission. I think we kind of have this backwards. We think it's work. But when you go to a buffet, let's say a Chinese buffet, do you complain about how many dishes are up there on the buffet? Oh, there's so many dishes here. Oh my goodness, how am I going to eat all this? <laughs> or you're like, wow, this is cool. I got a lot of options. Well, praise God, he's kept a lot of options for us in this great commission. So in other words, this is our feast. This is our buffet. You want to get closer to Christ? You want to introduce Jesus Christ to a whole new people group that's never heard of him before? You still, you still can do that. We can still do that in this age. It's still a possibility. It's still open. And this is the highest calling and the most challenging and the most rewarding call you could ever accept. And I can say this with confidence because I've seen a lot of people start out saying, I don't know if I could do that. I'm not sure I can do that. But take one little step. Take another little step. Take another little step. And then God brings them to like a big choice and they take that choice. And then God starts to bless. And then they come back and they tell their stories. And that's what you're going to hear the rest of this weekend is people, ordinary people like you and me, nothing special. Of course, they're all special because Christ makes us special. And they come back. In fact, there was a young lady, ah, 2011, January 10, 2011. We had a faith camp in Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, it's an amazing story. She has spoken with her husband at faith camps in the past. You can hear her full story, but she was on the front row. She was crying. She was tears running down her face saying, God, I don't have a story of faith. I don't have a miracle story where you've come through for me. I know you're there because I read it in your word, but I don't know that for sure because I haven't experienced that. She was very wealthy. We have a photo of she and her husband sitting on, you know, she was sitting on his lap with $2 million worth of gold bullion on the table. Very wealthy. Never really needed God. <laughs> but she had a heart desire for him. And so she and her husband had really sought after God, put their business aside and sought for nothing, read nothing but the Bible and the spirit of prophecy for two years straight. And so they had a strong connection, but they, there was something missing. And she cried. She says, Lord, I want to have a story like that. And now they got the most amazing stories to tell of what God has done. In fact, one I just heard just a few months ago where in Indonesia, they're Indonesian, and her mother had passed away. And she is the oldest in her siblings, oldest daughter. And so it's her responsibility to provide for the funeral. And they're supposed to be really nice funerals, okay, because of the society, the level of society she's from. So it could cost like $12,000 for a funeral. But she had, they had sold everything and put it into ministry. They have a television network that they have a studio and a satellite dish that goes up to the satellite and it broadcasts over entire Indonesia. And that's what they do now, put everything they had into it. And now they're living month to month by faith. And so she didn't have any money. So she, she went down to the, I don't know, what do you call them, the funeral home. And the lady talked to them and said, what, you, you know, asked them what they need and then wrote down, okay, you need this, 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 and this. And she's like, wow, you know, I don't know how this is going to work, but Lord, um, well, I have to do this. Otherwise, if, if I don't do this, 
then everybody's going to, they already think that we're foolish for giving up our money. But if I don't do this, they th they're going to think you can't provide. So she said, she, she put this, she gave this to God. Anyway, they had the funeral, about $12,000 worth. She came in to pay. She didn't have any money, but she came in to the talk to the lady and explain. And the lady says, okay, here's the bill, $200. And she's like, what? If you... Why are you doing this? If you charge me that much, you're, you're gonna go completely out of business. And here's the story that the lady told her. She says, I had a dream a few nights before you came in to see me. And in my dream, I saw you come into my shop. And the angel told me, you provide free of charge this, 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 and this for her. <laughs> um, so God did that for her. Another time they were driving down the road, and um, it was actually here in America, they had to get to Colorado. They only had like $200 in their pocket, and um, they had to live for another five days or so, um, and they had a family of, I think, five to take care of, so hotels and everything like that. They were driving down the road, and they saw a guy broke down on the side of the road, so they pulled off, and the guy says, I need $150 to get to where I need to go. And so the guy, and the husband, this is Ramon, he says, well, I only have $200, so here, let me give you $50, because I don't know how I'm gonna do this, and you know how men get stressed out when they don't have enough to provide for their families. And um, gave him $50, went and got back in the car, and the wife says, how much did you give him? I gave him $50. Man, where's your face? And she hit him, faith. She hit him and said, get out there and give him the rest. This is the woman that was crying, saying, I have no stories of faith. Of course, God provided for them. Amazing story after story after story. And God can do this for anybody if we step out, if we step out. And you're going to hear a lot of stories of faith. I could go on and on and on and on. It's awesome. But this is what we have. This is the place. These are the places that we can exercise our faith. We can get those stories of God coming through for us. This is where it's at. This is where it's at. Okay. All right. This is, um, there. All right. When we were first, when we first formed Jesus for Asia, the Lord gave us some success and we were really, you know, going forward and growing rapidly. And then he took us into, in fact, he told me he was going to do this, but he took us into the desert. <laughs> you know, when, when uh, the children of Israel left Egypt, had all those miracles, Red Sea split, and then they went into the desert. It's like, it's not very pretty in the desert. In fact, it's a very difficult place in the desert. They don't have a lot of water. They don't have Walmarts there. It's hard to live. I drove through the Negev Desert one time in 1984, and it's crazy. There's, I mean, there's no life support there. Uh, it gets really hot, and you see these little spindly plants growing, and, and that's it. I mean, it is a desolate, desolate place. God took them in there for their character growth, okay? And so he took us into that, and I started doing, I started realizing, you know what? Our church, in general, is really not interested in foreign missions. They like, we like to hear the exciting stories. We like to hear the miracle stories. But then I kind of sense that we're kind of jealous. You know, how come all the miracles happen over there and they don't happen here? I can give you some pretty obvious answers for that. <laughs> Uh, one of them being that we don't need them here. We have insurance. <laughs> we have everything taken care of. We're rich and increased with goods, right? So how do we get more miracles? Give away everything that we have and serve God 100%. I believe that if we serve God 100% in this country, we'd start seeing, seeing all kinds of miracles. But we're here serving really ourselves. We're serving the American dream. We're trying to get more. We're tr we, we have to have this and we have to have that in order to be safe, in order to be secure. Not realizing that those very security things that we see as security 
retirement, all that kind of stuff, those are clogs. Those are, t those are ropes to tie our emotions and our affections to this earth and keep them away from Christ. But Christ was, he's so powerful and so loving that he could take several million people into the Negev desert and 40 years later, they came out healthier. So if God can provide for several million people in the desert, he can provide for us in this land of plenty, don't you think? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so I started feeling like, you know, I'm focused on foreign missions uh, because there's still a job to do out there. And when I, we started having some trouble in our programs overseas, and I tried to tell people about that and they just didn't seem interested. They didn't want to hear the trouble. They didn't want to hear the hardships that we, were, that, that we were having in the mission field. And I'm like, what in the world? So I talked to the Adventist director, Adventist mission director at the GC, and I says, do you ever get the feeling that foreign missions is kind of the ugly stepchild of the Adventist church? <laughs> he kind of looked at me like, you know, he's not allowed to go on record of saying anything, but he had that look of, oh, you see it too, huh? <laughs> And I'm really sorry to say that, but I'll show you evidence that we as a church have abandoned, statistically, we have abandoned foreign missions. I'll show you that. And I started to get really depressed. It's like, wow, how come people aren't interested? How come they're not engaged with this missions thing? So I did some research. I went on to AdventistArchives.org and they have the North American Division uh, quarterly reports from 1933 all the way to 2006 at the time. I was doing this in 2009. So they had the quarterly reports. So I went in, they're all PDFs. So I went in and I hand copied the tithe, the membership, the offering, and any offering given to foreign missions. I copied that into a spreadsheet. And then I ran it through the inflation calculator on the government's labor, uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics website. They have a little calculator. You put in the amount, you put in the date, and then you put in today's date or whatever date you want, and then it'll match it. So like $2 in, 2000, or in 1933 would equal like $80 in 2008 something like that. So I ran the, all the numbers through that, and then I divided it by membership. So this is the average church member. This is the tithe that they give, gave. So in 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 1933, they would give about $200 in tithe, an actual tithe, in, in uh, actually in today's money. In today's money, they give, the average Adventist gives about $825 a year for tithe. Okay, so there's been a, a, a big increase in prosperity in the 19th century, 20th century. Okay, local church budget offerings has kind of followed the trend of the economy, the trend of tithe. But look what's happened to world missions. Wow. So in 1933, if we base the tithe giving as 10% of uh, the average church member's income, in 1933, the average church member would give 6% of his income to foreign missions. Today, I'm not sure what percentage that is, but it's not 6%. In fact, in 1933, for every $10 given to tithe, they would give another $6 to foreign missions. Today, for every $10 given to tithe, 28 cents is given to foreign missions. Now this is only through the church. This isn't through supporting ministries and things like that. And so a lot of people say, well, that doesn't include supporting ministries. So if you add in supporting ministries, everything's fine. Um, but however, that's not really the case. If you add in all supporting ministries, it comes up to right about there, right under the, the S, a little bit below the S. So 
do you think that we are doing everything we can to reach the world for Christ? Do you think we could do a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, Mrs. White makes a statement. She says, if the little bit that we do was the best we could do, we would not be under condemnation. But with our resources, we could do so much more. And remember, what is the, what is the church in Revelation that we identify with? Laodicea. You're not hot, not cold. I am going to spit you out of my mouth. Isn't that, I mean, being in that position in his mouth where he's getting ready, isn't that being under condemnation? So we, as a people, are living right now under condemnation. But we feel like we're okay. In fact, we don't think there's a problem. This is the same thing in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 is another message to the Laodiceans. Okay, Malachi chapter 3, you know what that is. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Okay. The beginning of that passage is, starts out with who, you know, the, the, the angel of the covenant shall suddenly come into his temple. Okay. Who, when did that happen? 1844. Exactly. So that message is for the Day of Atonement, the real Day of Atonement, not the one in the Old Testament. Right now, that's today's message. And what is the message? It says, I will, he will sit as a refiner of, of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi. Who are the sons of Levi? Yeah, the church, us, okay? So his purpose for coming, for, his purpose for the Day of Atonement is to purify himself a people. Okay, and how is he going to do that? What is the issue that he has? What is the thing that he wants to deal with with his people? First of all, he spends one verse. He says, I will be a witness, a swift witness against. Okay, so he's not going to deal with them. He's just going to like cut them out. Sorcerers, whoremongers, you know, evil people, that kind of thing. But then he spends five verses dealing with one issue with the remaining people that he loves. And that issue is, ye have robbed me. And the church's response is, what? You know, really? Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, it says, you, you, have, you have departed. And, in, and then they say, in which way have we gone away from your ordinances? It's kind of like, you know, to, a young couple gets married and he's a taker and she's a giver. So she's giving, 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 giving. He's just taking, taking, taking. He thinks everything is wonderful and she's burning out. And one day he, she comes to him and she says, oh, I can't take it anymore. I need to have a divorce. And he's like, what? Was there something wrong with our relationship? I thought we had a great marriage. You know, I think that's the same thing. I see that as the same thing here is this Laodicean thing. You, you're rich and increased with goods and no not. You have no clue this relationship is on the rocks. And so the advice is bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. And so when, when we think of tithes, we think this month's tithe, next month's tithe, month after that's tithe. That's the way I grew up thinking about it. I could never figure out why is that tithes plural. Until a few years ago, we did a study. And in the Old Testament, the minimum amount that the people in, the, in Israel, when they had a nation, were required to give to religious purposes was 25%. 25%. So there's your tithes. You know, first tithe, second tithe, third half tithe. <laughs> she says most of them gave 30%. But the priest would go around and ascertain and grill you, did you give your full tithe. And of course, the first, first tithe was supposed to be for the Levites. Second tithe, you were supposed to throw a big party and invite the strangers. And, you know, so I see that as missions. 
you know, local or they didn't really have foreign missions. It was a whole different evangelistic model that Jesus, that, the, that God had in the Old Testament versus in the New Testament. Different evangelistic approach. And then the 5%, the remaining 5%, that was like temple tax. So for me, it makes sense. You've got 10% for tithe, 10% for missions, and 5% for local church budget. Cool, huh? So that's what was required back then. So bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Now you would think, well, I would think, if I start giving 30% or 25% of my income, I'm going to go broke. And Mrs. White says, you would think that this would bring them to poverty. But she says, this was the basis of their prosperity. That if they didn't do that, they would become poor. If they did that, they would have prosperity. And I've heard well, one pastor told me, he said, um, well, that was in that day. With this day, with so many more, you know, totally different situation, that can't, we can't have to give that much. Which, by the way, you know, my goodness, um, we get to give that much. <laughs> um, but she also says that in this our day, with world evangelism before us, we should give more. Crazy, huh? So this is God's prescription. He deals with it. He says this is what needs to happen. And you can see why that message is so appropriate. Let's look at this. So we're wondering, God, why don't we see more of you in our church? Why don't we see more of you in our lives? Well, maybe this is why. Maybe that's why. Okay, just to give you an example of the disparity, the imbalance. In the North American division, we have about 4,000 pastors. I'm sorry, this is, um, we have about 300 million people. Each circle is a person. Uh, it's actually 10 million people. Okay, each circle is 10 million people. In the North India Union alone, just one union in India, there's 650 million people, over twice, okay? About 4,000 pastors, each star represents 100 pastors. In the North American Division, now I don't think we have enough pastors. We could use a bigger workforce. More churches, more church plantings, it could happen. We definitely have room for that. How many pastors do you think they have in the North India Union? 97. Yeah. In fact, um, just last week I heard somebody tell me that one of the early presidents of the Adventist Church, the president of the GC, um, told a congregation, he says, we have, I think it was like 100, we have 100 pastors in North America and only 20 pastors are we supporting overseas. That has to change. How come the few you know, numbers of people here in North America get more pastors than we're sending overseas. And I think that's the right attitude. That is the right attitude. We really, if I believe if we wanted more of God's blessings, we would send more over to where, they, where it's needed. And God would show up. Okay. Let's keep going here. Okay. Now, The joy. We think that missions, that sharing, that going into the hard places of the earth and sharing the gospel is difficult. But the one thing that Christ was pursuing, the reason why he went to the cross, was for the joy. In fact, he's the most intelligent being in the whole universe. And he was looking around, where can I find more joy? Where can my joy be enriched? And he saw this little planet that was lost. And he says, that's where I can find the joy. That's where the joy is. And I think you'll hear through this weekend, those that have engaged and are out there, um, you'll see a joy that they don't normally have. 
I used to take students from my class at Pacific Union College. I used to take them overseas to, to India and Thailand and Cambodia and introduce them to missionaries working on the front lines. And it used to just blow their minds because it seemed as though the happiest people were the ones that sacrificed the most um, <laughs> and are out there engaging with God's kids. Okay, who for the joy that was set before him. So this work that he has given us, it's a feast. It's a feast of joy. Yeah, there's difficulties, but there's difficulties here. Now, we are, right now, I think it's really important to be aware with the fact that our church is abandoning foreign missions, statistically, that we've developed a culture, a culture of thinking where we can um, not do what God has told us to do and still feel like we're okay with him or he's okay with us. I wanna show you a little taste of a different culture, okay? Now, I first started to get a sense of this when I was gonna go in 2010 over to Bangkok and, sh and document uh, the effect of the decline of giving to foreign missions on the front lines. We did a show called I Want the City. And I went to buy my shoes and I told the shoe salesman, yeah, I'm, I'm buying shoes because I'm going to Bangkok and to document how my church is abandoning foreign missions. <laughs> Sorry, I was a little bit... I kind of get tired of not talking about it personally. And, and forgive me, I don't mean to come out uh, condemning. I'm not because I believe God has a place for his church. I, the probation's not closed yet. God loves his church. If you look at the promise for the Laodicean church, it's amazing. It's an amazing promise. And you look at the promise for bringing all the tithes into the storehouse, it's a huge blessing. And so God loves his church and he wants to pour out the blessing. We've got to do this thing. We've got to fill the re fulfill the requirements. Anyway, he said, my church is, an ab is not abandoning foreign missions. Uh, I says, really, what church do you go to? He says, well, I'm a Mormon. And he says, um, you know, when I, was, when I was a teenager, I would go out and mow lawns. If I earned $100, I'd put $10 to tithe, and the remaining 90, I'd split in half, and 45 would go into my mission fund. So that when I was called, I was self-funded. That culture, that culture, was encouraged, it was taught, it was, to use an Ellen White term, inculcated <laughs> into the people, okay? And they don't get to choose where they go. They didn't get to choose where, he, where he's gonna go. He one day received a letter, you are going to go here. That's where he's assigned, so he went there. And many people will think, well, it must be really hard. I wanna show you this video of these young people receiving their letters. Tell me if you think it's a drudgery. Okay. Can you hit the space bar? We are assigned to labor in the Peru Lima East. <laughs> Amazing, huh? That's what we could do. Is their message more vital than ours? Do they have a better doctrine? Do they have a better message? than we do? Does anybody believe that? No. <laughs> they sent out last year 72,000 people, missionaries. 70,000 missionaries. And their church is only 14 million in size. But did you hear that passion, that excitement? How come we can't have that? Most of my mission, most of, well, some of my missionaries 
they, when they talk to me, says, is it possible that we can go then before they launch? This young person I'm, I'm thinking of right now. Is it possible that, that we can go? Yeah, go. How does this work? Well, you know, you tell your friends and everything, and, and the Lord provides. And so they called me a couple months later. She's like, man, this is really weird. I tell people that I want to go as a missionary, and they start trying to tell me, talk me out of it. They start telling me, you know, why would you want to sacrifice for that? Why do you want to do that? You've got such, I mean, you have a nursing degree. Go, go get, earn some money. Go. Why is it like that? It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Because I can't change the church, but I can change my attitudes. And if somebody wants to go, we can get excited about them. You know, it doesn't mean we're going to make it easy. It doesn't mean they're going to get all selfish on us. Just get excited for them. Hey, let's throw a party, you know. <laughs> let's make them our heroes. Our heroes. There's um, the, the parable of the talents. Remember the parable of the talents? And uh, the slothful servant, he held on to the doctrines. He held on to the teachings, and Jesus says, you slothful servant. You could have at least put it out to the exchangers. And what are the exchangers? I believe that the exchangers are people that would take your money, put it on the market, do something with it, and it would grow, at least a percentage. I believe that's like missionaries. <laughs> you know? Give, you, maybe, maybe I can't go, and that's okay. I can be a part of it, by sending somebody, by sponsoring a project, by sponsoring a mission organization. And they will take my money and they'll get heavenly treasure out of it, which is better than earthly treasure. <laughs> it lasts longer. Okay. Okay. Now I want to go back to that whole idea. I'm going to close here. That whole idea of heaven. Remember I said heaven is not a place. Okay? Heaven is not a place. Here is the definition of heaven. As through Jesus we enter into rest, heaven begins here. That's right. Heaven begins here. We respond to his invitation, come learn of me, and in thus coming we begin the life eternal. It starts here. Heaven, this is the definition of heaven. Heaven is a ceaseless approaching to God through Christ. <laughs> the longer we are in the heaven of bliss, the more and still more of glory will be open to us. And the more we know of God, the more intense will be our happiness. What does that make God? Happy. I mean, really happy. We serve a happy God. I don't know about you, but that blew my mind. I just figured this out a couple years ago. <laughs> that we serve a happy God. You know, because, I mean, like, you know, the, pro the closer I approach a fire, the hotter I get because the fire is hot. So if the closer I approach to God, the happier I get, that means that God is happy. We serve a happy God. We serve a happy God. And so I believe that God looked at, okay, when God created the earth and everything was perfect and he put Adam and Eve right there, he said, if I don't give them something to do, they're going to become unhappy. So I need to design my universe, I design my wor world in a way that they have something to do. And it can't just be busy work. It has to be something meaningful, okay? It's like, you know, sailors on a long voyage and the captain says, go up and scrub the decks. Okay, go up and scrub the decks. Next day, go up and scrub the... We just scrubbed them yesterday, you know, just to keep them busy. That's frustrating. But it's something vital for them to do, okay? So if Jesus now gives us, brings us into salvation and then just has us sit, we would get bored. And so he looks around and he says, what can I have them do to bring them more joy? And he says, oh, I can give them world evangelism, world evangelism, that. 
I can have them work for the salvation of other people's souls. Cool. That is the blessing for our joy, okay? Because he's working for those souls already. And as we enter into that work, we become co-laborers with him. And the Bible becomes more alive. You know, the Bible's a, a driver's manual. It's not a... And, and unless we're out there doing it, then, then it, it just it doesn't have as much meaning. So the happiness is found out there. The f happiness is found in giving and being and connecting with Christ. Let me continue this same quote. As we walk with Jesus in this life, we may be filled with his love, satisfied with his presence. All that human nature can bear, we may receive here. <sighs> yeah, that's amazing. Now, this is a quote from C.S. Lewis. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We, have, we are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And I think that this is very accurate for me because, yeah, I'm happy to just settle with the things of the world, with a car, a nice car, with a nice house, comfortable, easy life. I'm happy with that. But there's so much more out there. There is so much more that it's hard to imagine what he has for us. Who can measure the love of Christ, Christ felt for a lost world as he hung upon the cross, suffering for the sins of guilty man? This love was immeasurable, infinite. We look at taking the gospel to the world as painful. We look at the cross that Jesus hung on. We talk about the pain, the, you know, the pain that he must have suffered. And the pain was excruciating. I, I, I absolutely not discounting that at all, but look what this statement says. Look what he felt that was stronger than the pain. Love. He felt that love while hanging on the cross. I like to feel love. Love's a good feeling. So maybe we are running from something that would be wonderful. I was talking one time in a Sabbath school about these, these people in India that have no access to the gospel and the things that they have to do to appease the gods. And somebody in the Sabbath school class said, why are you worried about them? I mean, don't, don't, don't worry about them too much. There are organizations that take care of them. I know. <laughs> and I says, you know what? If my heart doesn't break, for those people, what kind of heart do I have? A heart of stone. That's right. If I can't feel for them, then I start to lose all feeling. And we see a world that is searching for something to feel. Searching for something to feel, whether through music or drugs or fast, I mean, I was like that. I, I, I spent a number of years away from Christ, and I was just utterly bored, bored to tears. I was looking for something exciting, you know, drive my car faster, ride my motorcycle faster, ski faster, do anything to feel something. When I met Christ. It's like, wow, that's awesome. And so being a part of his work, I just, I just love it. It's, it's, I think most of you that... I think all of you have experienced it. It's addicting. It's addicting in a good way. <laughs> it builds you up and it builds you up as you build up others. One soul saved in the kingdom of God is worth more than 10,000 worlds like this. According to the math, according to that math, if I invested my entire Everything that I owned in this life into saving one soul, heaven would see that as a good investment. 
If I ended up working in a hard labor camp in Siberia and ended up dying for saving one soul, heaven would see that as a good investment. Because how long is this life anyway? 80 years, if you're lucky or unlucky, 100 years. You know, that's nothing compared to several billion years that we're going to have up in heaven. Okay, I'm going to keep moving on. Okay, every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. Uh, I'm going to skip this. I think we're running out of time. I'll show you that later. It's a video of a unreached city. When we love the world as Christ has loved it, then for us, his mission is accomplished. How did Christ love the world? He gave himself for it. So he died for it. And we think that's a place of pain. But look what it says. We are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. Having a broken heart for the world is a place of heaven. I used to think, I know, I used to think that, you know, if I care about those people, you know, it's going to hurt. I don't want to, I don't want to hurt. I don't want to care about them. Not realizing <laughs> that's where heaven is. Being poured out like Christ was. All right, this is what we were created for. And so, um, yes, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. Just this last weekend, I'm going to close with this thought. And you can pray about it and think about it. Uh, we, we were at Sabbath school, the last lesson on Acts. Paul sacrificed everything, invested everything that he had. Imagination, time, sweat, comfort, everything into the gospel. And um, the leader of the lesson said at the very end, he said two things. Number one, he said, Christ, this is Christ's mission. He doesn't need us. He invites us to participate with him. And you can, any of you guys have an issue with that statement? I have a huge issue with that statement because who else does he have? Where in, in the prophecy, in, where in Revelation does it say God was unable to work with his children so he used something else to take the gospel to the world? There's one missionary that says, we are God's plan A. He does not have a plan B. If we don't do it, then what happens? I'll tell you what happens. It doesn't get done. Which means people die an eternal death. That's what happens. How do I know that? I've been over there. I've seen it. People die every day having never heard the name of Jesus Christ. Why haven't they heard? We haven't told them. People say, well, if we don't do it, God will find some other way to do it. I don't see any evidence for that in the Bible or in life. It doesn't happen. It doesn't get done. Now, people, some people say, well, there will be people in heaven who've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. I believe that. I believe that. I believe there are three groups of people in the world, probably more, but this is kind of the way I reason it in my head. There will be people in heaven that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. So whether a missionary goes or not, they'll still be in heaven. Another group, that will not be in heaven, whether a missionary goes or not. Because there's many people, as you know, that you've witnessed to and they've rejected Jesus Christ. They've rejected salvation, okay? So whether you told them or not, 
they'd still reject. They still would not be in heaven. But then there's a third group that will not be in heaven, but if somebody came and told them about forgiveness, about the love of Christ, they would accept. So they would be in heaven when in otherwise they would not. Those are the people that we're looking for. <laughs> That's our gold. And those are the people that are dying right now. Every single day, they're dying, untold. You say, well, Jesus, Jesus will find a way. He, he's not. He's, I don't know why, but he's arranged it so that this job that he's given to his church is a vital job for his church to do. Not just his church, for me. And if I don't do my job, which is an awesome job, the greatest fun in the world, the greatest pleasure, and how I can grow. And, it, and if I don't do my job, they'll die for eternity. I'm not happy with that. I'm just not happy with that. Things have got to change. And you say, well, there's so much work out there. How in the world could that happen? You know, this could happen so fast. What does it need, what do we need? What, is it, what would it take to evangelize the whole world in this generation? It's, it's very, huh? <laughs> no, no, I don't want, I'm not ready to go there. <laughs> okay, the brother in the back said persecution. I don't want to go there yet. Let's try something else before God, I mean, maybe you like persecution, but I, I know you. <laughs> but um, all it would take, and this is, what this, actually, what you, per, you suggested, the persecution is a means to this. Yep, that's, that's right. So, what I think is all that needs to take place is revival. Revival for missions. Okay? So, let's look at the numbers. 6,000 unreached people groups. I can't reach 6,000 unreached people groups. You know, I'll be lucky if I can reach two. I'm trying for about 100. <laughs> That'd be cool, huh? I mean, like together, partnership. But me personally, I, I can't reach 6,000. But how many people are in our denomination in North America alone? About 1.1 million? Okay, on the books. So what if 10%, 110,000, what if 10% sold out for Christ and went and said, I want to find an unreached people group. I want, a, I, want, I want some of that buffet. I want some of that feast. What if 10% went, 110,000 missionaries? All of a sudden it's like, whoa, there's only 6,000 unreached people groups. How are we going to divide that, you know, be fighting over people groups? <laughs> you know, that's my people group. No, you, you know, maybe join together. It can be done. All we need is revival. Now, human nature will block us from doing that. You look back in history, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was, you know, some people say, well, you know, we just got to wait for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will do that for us. It'll give us that burden for souls. I don't think so. Because the disciples had the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured out of them so strong that it looked like tongues of flame on their head. And yet they didn't do it. They stayed in Jerusalem. And the Lord had to send persecution on them to get them out of Jerusalem. And he's back there nodding his head. That's what it's going to take. I don't want to wait for persecution to do this work. I think God would be so much more honored if we just did it voluntarily. <laughs> I mean, if you have a child and you say, clean your room, and you know, a couple hours later they're still not clean, clean your room, doesn't do it. Clean your room, doesn't do it. Clean your room, doesn't do it. And give them a spanking. You have to give them a spanking to get them to clean their room. That's not as much fun. 
is if you just say, hey, clean your room, and the kids, oh, okay, mommy, let's go and clean the room, and you come back, and everybody's happy. But Mrs. White says that the work that the church does not do in times of ease and prosperity, it will have to do in times of extreme difficulty. And this year is harder than it was 10 years ago. India's closing, Thailand's getting harder, where Mike is, it's not getting easier. It's not getting easier. So let's do as much as we can this weekend, this week, this month, this year, and not stop until Christ says, okay, you're done, thou good and faithful servant. Ah, I'm excited because God is going to do this. If I look at how the world, how the, the, the gospel is progressing in the world, I get really discouraged. If I look at Matthew 24, 14, I get really excited. This gospel will be preached. I just want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of it because that's where the joy is. <sighs> Let us close with prayer. Father God, you're amazing. And I have no, we don't even have the capacity to, be, to understand how amazing you really are. And you're amazing in ways that we don't understand because we're selfish. We don't understand your joy. You have so much joy, so much happiness, and you love to just spill it out everywhere. And you're so generous, Father. You're so generous. Father, this weekend we just open our hearts for your Holy Spirit, for your presence, Father. We want more. We want more of you. Sometimes I sense my heart wants to resist and doesn't want to go experience all that you have, have for me. Father, help me to realize that that is my flesh and it doesn't speak for my best interest. My flesh and my desire for comfort and my desire for the pleasures of this world, that's not in my best interest, Father. You've given us everything that we need for joy more intense, more full, more real than we've ever experienced. Father, there's more out there. What we have experienced so far is just a tiny, tiny taste of what you have for us in this earth, in this world. So Father, this weekend we ask for your Holy Spirit. We expect your Holy Spirit because we're asking and your word says that you want to give us your Holy Spirit. You're a good God. And we're loved by you. And we praise you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.